So welcome everyone. My name is Farhan Banji. I'm one of the uh, pediatric ICU attendings here at the, at the uh, MCH. Um, I get the privilege to uh, introduce you all to uh, Vinay Ned Carney. Uh, some of you were here for the presentation yesterday, but, but many of you weren't, so I'm actually going to start again. Um, for those of you who don't know Vinay, uh, Vinay is an incredible individual that we're very fortunate to have here at McGill. He is a professor and endowed chair at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, and the Perelman uh, School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. If I told you that Vinay had you know, 85 publications, three in the New England Journal, two as senior author, um, three papers or two papers in JAMA, uh, three in JAMA Pediatrics, which is a top journal in pediatrics, and 18 in resuscitation, um, which has the highest impact factor of all the emergency medicine journals. I think most of you say, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. If I told you that that's what he's done since January 1st, 2017, I think most of you would be utterly stunned. And those of you that don't research, just think about that, 85 publications, including three in the New England Journal. Um, Vinay has almost, or has 500 publications and book chapters. Um, the thing that's really interesting is for me, uh, knowing him, uh, and I've published with him and I've done work with him, he's actually a better innovator, uh, leader, than he is an educator. That's hard to imagine when you publish 500. Um, Vinay has been the only pediatric co-chair of the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. He's received the award as a giant of resuscitation uh, from the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. That goes out to five people in the world every five years, roughly, give or take. And he's only the third pediatrician to receive that. He's received Lifetime Achievement Awards from the American Heart Association for Emergency Cardiovascular Care and the American Academy of Pediatrics um, in Pediatric Critical Care. His list of awards for um, national and international recognition is a page long on his CV. We're fortunate to have him. The, the, the other thing that Vinay does better than anybody else that I know is he gets people to think and he mentors people in even, even far away. He's mentored over 100 um, researchers, PhDs, master's students, um, and, he's, and he's helped much of the world. He builds networks. He's been the person that's actually built um, multiple education and clinical networks that group, include hospitals of 300s, like 300 hospitals together, 150 pediatric uh, simulation centers. So we're really fortunate to have Vinay here. He's going to talk to us today about resuscitation, pediatric and adult, the past, present, and future. And I think he's going to make us think about what we, what we want to do. The last thing, I don't know what Kevin's pointing to me, but the last thing that I wanted to, to actually say is the reason that Vinay's here um, and uh, is, is that we brought him here as the uh, visiting professor um, for the um, McGill Medical Simulation Center, the Steinberg Center for uh, Simulation and Interactive Learning. Um, he's our, our Flanders, visit, Flanders family visiting professor. Um, he gave great grand rounds this morning for the Department of Surgery, um, and he's here to present to us as the MUHC thinking about resuscitation. So with that, welcome Vinay. Well, thank you, uh, Farhan, and um, thank you to Kepi Flanders also for sponsoring uh, this visiting professorship, which I'm really learning more than I'm contributing back, I'm sure. Um, today I want to spend about 20 or 30 minutes talking and trying to stimulate you to think about the past, present, and mostly about the future of resuscitation, in that although I have some grants and sit on some scientific advisory boards, um, none of these are, none of the things I'm going to show you or any of the pictures of devices, et cetera, are intended to endorse any company or any individual device. It's simply to use it as an example to stimulate discussion. And um, what I want to do, I really would like to know and I'd like to think about the issues and problems and challenges that you have here and what, um, how you've solved them. So that's why I want to leave a little bit of time for discussion, question, answer, feedback. And some of that will be amongst yourselves, and some of that will be with me. But when I think about resuscitation and where we've been and where we're going, I'm struck all the time by how an anecdote, an experience, colors how we interpret the guidelines, what we did on the last patient and how it came out, how it influences what we do on this patient and the next patient, and how much it affects us. And so I want you to think a little bit about that last patient that you might have had to resuscitate, infant, child, adult, et cetera and how, how that is, how you're putting that into the data bank to manage the next child. 
And, and um, one of the hardest things, and Farhan is actually one of the masters of this, is, is, is trying to get us to think about how we're going to take that, you know, the evidence-based, you know, uh, uh, evaluation, evidence-based medicine that kind of originated here, you know, and, and how we're going to use that framework to inform our practice but not to paralyze us to not be able to do and make decisions because there isn't a strong evidence base. And I will admit that in most of the things that we're doing in resuscitation right now, the evidence basis is quite poor, is experiential, is consensus-based, may have some elements. But what I hope to show you is a few examples and maybe get some questions and feedback on some of the big trials that either are recently published that are out there that people are thinking about if they're going to change their practice or not. You know, epinephrine, LMAs, am I going to ventilate at all? Um, those kinds of issues. And then think about the population and what the, the context in which those studies were done and whether they really apply to us and whether we should be changing our practice based on them. All of the information in terms of the evidence basis for what we'll talk about for the next 20 or 30 minutes is available to you at ilcor.org. So the latest worksheets, the latest evidence evaluation, and how it's interpreted by the so-called experts who are sitting around the table trying to, to sort of salvage that and discuss that is available to you at ilcor.org by topic. So let's sort of reflect. One of the things that strikes me about the past, present, and future is that a lot of what we can do and works in resuscitation is kind of in our own two hands, pushing hard, pushing fast, minimizing interruptions, allowing full chest recoil, not bagging too fast, and paying attention to the details, laying the hands on the patient to identify what the underlying condition is. Is one side of the chest not moving? Do they have a pneumothorax? Uh, do they have neck pain? things that are simple and easy are the drivers and the most important thing about the most advanced resuscitations. But sometimes we get distracted with the technology, sometimes we get distracted with the situation, and sometimes we really can't concentrate on the things that are most important. So how do we get the basics to everybody, yet still allow ourselves, when appropriate, to go on to ECMO, to be able to cannulate effectively, et cetera. And I hope to stimulate you to sort of think about how time-critical interventions are really important in all of our major, major resuscitation. Time is brain, time is breath, time is heart muscle, right? Time is life in cardiac arrest, time is life and limb in traumatic injury. So there really are tenets that run through, and it's how do we quickly sift to identify what are the interventions that are important and how do we do that? And do we continue in the future to do that just with our own eyes and hands or are there electronic big data, are there new things coming that will help us do that better? The problem is enormous. In North America, two 747s full of passengers crashing and burning, dying, no survivors each day, a thousand North Americans a day die of sudden cardiac arrest, a day. And two busloads of kids, 50 kids per, uh, 50 kids a day, say two school buses of 25 each, crashing, burning, no survivors, 50 kids a day die. But as we know, most of the adults who are having sudden cardiac arrest are in fact older and have some underlying conditions that mean that the quality of life saved per individual is 10, 20, sometimes 30 years. Whereas a child, when they are resuscitated, oftentimes they have healthy hearts, they oftentimes have long life, productive lifespans if we can reverse that sudden arrest quickly, airway or cardiac, and so they might have 60 or 70 or 80 lives. So although only about 10% of the people who arrest are kids, it multiplies up the quality of life saved years when we resuscitate children. I'm a pediatrician, so I'm advertising a little for the value of training both on adults and children. But think with me for a moment of that breakthrough that McGill discovers today that actually works, that's, that seems to work. It's a single center. Uh, they, they develop that breakthrough. And then those investigating investigators, where it really works in their hands, publish that. And then they replicate it. 
and it goes into a multi-center clinical trial. What's very consistent across resuscitation trials is from that pilot study to the first multi-center trial, about 20 percent of the efficacy of that intervention is generally lost because it might be a select population. Maybe they don't do it as well when you start to roll it out. There are always things, maybe the criteria are a little bit different. The person who invented it is not sitting at the bedside titrating things just the same way. So the efficacy is kind of established. But then when it starts to go into multi-center application, people pick it up, or effectiveness. When we then, the, goes into general practice, the efficiency of it, we get this drop off, this loss in translation, so that the patients, when they get that intervention, oftentimes only about 20 percent of the effect of the initial brilliant effect that was possible actually is makes it through that translation line all the way. To, it's kind of like an Olympic event, those rings actually happening uh, to persist. But, so these are the clinical trials, and then it sort of moves into the real world registries, audits, quality improvement area, and that's where the drop off seems to occur. But uh, more recently, with more advanced implementation techniques, including simulation, that drop-off is much less. And we're starting to see that as we incorporate these kind of quality improvement measures, focus on quality of the few things that work, we can start to see almost a doubling of survival in adults and children with intact neurologic survival in systems of care that have been able to do the Olympic rings a little bit better. So the this is, this is not with new breakthroughs. This is just with what we know now and when it's done and done well. Now, past, present, and future, truthfully, a lot of the interventions that seem to work that we know about, the push hard, push fast, minimize interruptions, uh, don't overventilate, but ventilate enough, um, avoid interruptions. All of these things were known in the 1950s and 1960s in the animal labs at Johns Hopkins University in Pittsburgh and with Peter Saffer. And so that set of what to do, including cooling after cardiac arrest, originates from the science and the physiology that's the same now that it was then. But our tools and our training and our implementation science is so much better now. What are some of the challenges? recognizing cardiac arrest. How hard is it for the layperson and sometimes our healthcare providers to recognize cardiac arrest? In children, it's predominantly, as you can see here, a respiratory etiology evolving to bradycardia, hypoxia, and asystole. In the adult, it's oftentimes with underlying coronary disease, sudden ventricular fibrillation, where hands-only CPR and a rapid defibrillation from an automated external defibrillator or a rapid EMS response makes all the difference. And so how to have people recognize that they're not having a heart attack, that they're dead, and to do something is sort of 90 percent of the issue of getting that initial treatment to that patient. And truthfully, even in our hospitals on our wards, it's very difficult for the general provider to have the gumption to recognize that, activate the team, and start CPR, get the pads or the paddles on the patient. Because it's something that they don't really want to happen, they weren't prepared for, and they weren't expecting. And so, the recognition and call to action is where a lot of the focus is right now because we know that just by doing that, particularly in communities, that we can double to quadruple survival from cardiac arrest. Pretty amazing. Now, I know a lot of you think about, and at this hospital and where you work, uh, you work like a pit crew. You guys train, you practice, you are the experts. And so when we think about that, we think kind of about a, uh, you know, the pit crew of a Ferrari team. And so let's watch them uh, change all the tires at a quick pit stop uh, on a race track. They are, they're an organized team, they're waiting, they're all set. Here comes the car, they've got the lollipop man directing them, the team leaders in place, poised and ready. One, two, three, four, five, they're done. Safe, 100% of the time, no faster. 
no slower. It works. And so they are one of the premier teams that can actually do it, right? Don't we wish that our trauma bay and our resuscitation bay could work like that? Well, maybe it can. Let's see what this other team can do. So here's another race, another team, another elite trained team. One, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven. About seven and a half seconds there. And oh, look what happened. Okay. So one of the things is that faster is not always, we talk about time critical interventions. We have to know the capability of our team. That was not the Ferrari team, no diss on them, but they just had not had the same level of training, familiarity, coordination, and they were trying to beat the Ferrari team. They were trying to do something that wasn't quite possible for their capability in that time, and they didn't check, check the boxes. And so we have to be a little careful of, of over expecting and trying to meet criteria that aren't possible in our environment. So two lessons, one is we can do it if we really train, et cetera, and have our roles delineated. But two, we have to know our limitations and we have to figure out. And what we need to do is to go back to that second event and figure out what it was. Is it that they could do it better if they had better supplies, teamwork, et cetera? Or is there a limitation that we need to say it's okay to slow down because that patient, that car, will do better if we just slow down a little bit and work within our capabilities to get the best safe result that we can. Now, what do we know? So Ian Steele and the folks in Toronto and across Canada have done many studies to try to find what elements of the ACLS protocol is it chest compressions. And we know that if there's no chest compressions and no early defibrillation available or tried, our survival outcomes are really poor. This is adult out of hospital cardiac arrest. But then if we add bystander CPR, we can double to quadruple that survival. So acting, acting in the home, in the casinos, in wherever people are dropping makes a huge dif difference. And then if we add early CPR, early defibrillation with excellent pre-hospital care, we now again can double survival from cardiac arrest and we get into the 20% range which is quite reasonable. But then those systems that have really worked on each segment, including the in-hospital post-arrest segment of advanced life support, are reporting now 30 to 60 percent survival with good neurologic outcome for adult victims of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that are witnessed. So it's to the point that we can say where it used to be dismal and hopeless and everybody had the feeling that CPR was a last rite, that now in the present at least there is, for the selected resuscitation circumstances, pretty reasonable outcome and we can probably do better, particularly if we select the patients that are appropriate for the advanced interventions that are now possible. When I think about it, I like to think about it as phases of cardiac arrest, pre-arrest, Preventing the arrest is obviously better than awaiting arrest and then responding to it. And our prediction capability is getting better and better. You know that the iWatch, which can now sense your pulse and your ECG rhythm and transmit it, geolocate you, and also has an actigraph in it to know if you're moving to confirm that that asystole it's reporting is associated with no movement, can now be accessed centrally and can essentially report either AFib or cardiac arrest. And so on the wrist, I'm not advertising the iWatch. There are, you know, Fitbit, everybody else is doing it as well, but they're the first one to be FDA approved for that device. So the, the capability of remote monitoring, both inside the hospital and outside the hospital at home, is on our doorstep and will be with us soon, the wearables, et cetera. And so detecting that early event is going to get better and better. And that means that the, that's the, the efferent limb to get people to that person who can help is going to get better and better. And of course, there are now apps that when you finish your basic life support or advanced life support course, uh, like Pulse Point, for example, you can volunteer for so that when that person drops in your apartment building, in your community, you can receive a notification on your phone that there is somebody who needs an AED or CPR right within 100 meters of you so that you could then, as a volunteer, respond until EMS can arrive. And so those 
it's ha those possibilities are here right now, and it's like our early warning systems for our patients on the wards, where we can now have our rapid response team come to them, identify where they are and what they need very quickly. Now, during the cardiac arrest, that's a no-flow time, and we quickly have to decide what the etiology of arrest was a sudden witnessed cardiac arrest where defibrillation is most likely to be needed, or was it a slow asphyxial airway breathing circulation problem that needs to be remediated, differentiate those and provide some circulation to the heart and brain, good quality chest compressions. And so if a shock is or is not needed can be quickly determined. And what we know in the future is that geolocation is getting better and better by phone, watch, et cetera, and that drones will be able to beat our EMS system to the site to deliver an AED or something to shock with quite quickly. And most of the defibrillator companies are working on uh, devices that would potentially allow you to deliver a shock through your phone an attachment that would have a pulse oximeter and allow you to shock through the phone. And so therefore, in the not too distant future, we will have within our reach the capability to provide blood flow and the capability to deliver a shock readily available within the first few minutes of arrest. So that will revolutionize, in my estimation, revolutionize what we are going to be able to do for victims of cardiac arrest. So for now, we're pushing hard, pushing fast, but one of the controversies that we'll talk about in a minute, and I'd love to hear from you about, is the concept of mechanical CPR and whether we should be moving towards or away from that uh, potential reality. And we'll talk a little bit about the issues of vasopressors as well. Now, one of the most ignored and probably most important areas of focus is that post-resuscitation phase. After the resuscitation, people leave the room. They're all going back to their own busy lives and patients and trying to put things back in order. That patient is oftentimes left at the most vulnerable time to become hypotensive, hyperoxic or hypoxic, hypercarbic or hypocarbic, and to have their temperature fluctuate either too cold or too warm. And so a lot of attention, the flashlight is kind of being shined on that immediate first six hours after cardiac arrest where there's some important associations of variability and deviations from a post-arrest protocol that's targeted temperature management, generally to therapeutic normothermia, although there's some enthusiasm for therapeutic hypothermia that remains, as well as targeting the diastolic blood pressure to be in the normal range, not just above the fifth percentile, but actually in the normal range. And there's suggestions of that association. The same thing with oxygen, that too much oxygen, just putting them on 100% oxygen is potentially harmful for adults unless it is titrated to 94 to 98%. And we don't know the precise saturation it should be titrated to because we really don't know the brain oxygen saturation. We just estimate it from near-infrared spectroscopy and other types of in sort of not so valid kind of ways of detecting cerebral blood flow and cerebral oxygenation. But in the near, not so far future, there probably will be much better availability of ways to quickly assess the deeper structures of the brain with brain oxygen saturation, and also to monitor the background EEG activity that will help us to know whether there is sort of a very poor prognosis or very good prognosis right now, the best we can do is generally after three days of support, we can get a relatively reliable estimate, not perfect, but a relatively reliable estimate after three days of what the potential is or the association is with good, poor, or very poor neurologic outcome. So what are we doing? We're trying to address this piece by piece. In the pre-arrest phase, identifying the most at-risk patients. In my ICU, our um, electronic medical record, which is, um, you know, there are two major, Epic or Cerner are the ones that dominate in the United States. We have one of them. And it runs in the background, and it's taking all the pieces of information about their vital signs and their labs 
and the results and their history, and it's putting it together in the background using big data, and then it comes up in our 65-bed pediatric ICU with the top four or five kids who are most likely to arrest based on prior, prior criteria, plus adding in at our morning and afternoon safety huddle things that the providers know, like this is a difficult airway patient who needs to be intubated for MRI that makes them at risk for cardiac arrest, but it's not showing up in the medical record because they're not intubated yet. And so we add that sort of quanti qualitative information in to the quantitative information that the record is, and we can find our hot spots in our ICU or on our wards. We roll up refresher carts to the bedsides of those highest risk patients. We rearrange the bedside to prepare it for resuscitation, and we make sure that the tools and medications and priorities are known for the providers who are taking care of that kid. And it takes like five minutes. It's just we round on those patients first, and we have one of our nurses, our resource nurses, essentially rearrange, move the poles to the head of the bed, get the step stools by the side, make sure the boards underneath and that people who are taking care of them know where the pads will go on the chest, et cetera. And that preparation is kind of a just-in-time refresher. They actually even practice good quality CPR on the rolled up, the mannequin that's rolled up right outside their room. But they don't have to go to a sim center, they don't have to go away from the bedside. And they feel prepared and they are allowed to ask questions like, gee, you know, I haven't used a defibrillator in a while. Can you remind me on this one where the sync button is and, and what it looks like when I turn it on? It's like it's an opportunity for them to ask what they want. And then after that, if the patient arrests during the CPR, the monitor defibrillators have accelerometers on them that actually pump out and show them the depth and the rate and the no-flow time real time so that they can actually monitor during the arrest the quality of their CPR for the few things we know that work. And then afterwards, they have a brief two to three minute team reflection where they, just like was done with the mass casualty in the little groups, we're just gonna pull from people the key things we need to think about and go debrief on. And then proactively, we pre-brief for each shift of nurses on what is the most likely thing to have. If we're cooling, what's gonna happen to the potassium? What am I gonna do with the urine output? What's my target for blood pressure? What if I see a seizure? Do I have my antiepileptics available, ordered, in the right place? Do I have my cooling pad underneath and above the patient? Uh, if I have the cooling pads on and I need to put defibrillator pads on, I've forgotten. Can I, put the, you know, can I put them next to the cooling pad or not? So all of the little like pieces that make things go smoothly during a resuscitation, but if you don't think of them ahead of time, yeah, the defibrillator's over there, the cooling pads are over there, but you don't really put it together. And those little time-saving moments, time is brain. And so we're thinking that that would help us. And then, um, so that we call them dress rehearsals. They're sort of those anticipated problems that we're troubleshooting ahead of time. And then when the patient leaves the unit about two weeks later, we will then have a quantitative debriefing where we pull all the quantitative data and the qualitative discussions together, and over lunch, we have a meeting where we'll actually present that, go through it, and see where we did and didn't meet the guidelines and what the outcome was. And those are not just for the team that was there, those are education, we call them educational or environmental debriefings that include anybody who's there that day that wants to listen in. Um, and then we link that with a patient outcome. So we follow that patient until discharge and then out to a year with neurologic follow-up, et cetera. That's done with a research team. That's done with extra resources. But with that approach, we actually have been able to track and follow our progress with cardiac arrest in our unit, compare it to the get with the guidelines 340 hospitals across the country, and our survival with good neurologic outcome has gone, I'm proud to say, from 29% which was right at the middle of the pack, to 54%, which over the last three years is really good for us, uh, but we can do better. And we know that we still don't meet all the guidelines and don't, there are still many things that we can fix. But because we're measuring what we're doing, providing feedback and debriefing, and it's become part of the culture, it's starting to trickle over into our ARDS management. People now want it for our intractable seizure patients, for other difficult to control problems, it's starting to change the culture of how we do things. Rather than training every two years, we're really bringing it to just in time, just in place, little 
low-dose, high-frequency training that's changing our practice, and we're trying to measure the outcomes that go along with it. And as Farhan and I were talking about here, I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about is there a way in the emergency department, in the ICUs, on the wards, is there a way to start to apply that? So where are we changing? Where, what are things are going on? So as I said, early recognition and response is coming a long way, not just from empowering the bedside providers, the parents, the family members, et cetera, to speak up. So in our hospital, the family members can activate the rapid response team whenever they want. They do it about twice a year, frankly. We thought they were going to do it like every day, twice a day. Uh, but truthfully, once empowered to do that and what to look for, they rarely activate it because they actually feel more empowered to speak up to the nurse and the doctor about issues that they sense. Uh, they're sensing that their family member is a little off today. They're not comfortable. They're somehow agitated or sleepy or whatever out of proportion to their disease process. And that is allowing the team then to do an earlier intervention. The early warning scores, the vital signs are running in the background. That's helping us physiologically try to identify those. But truthfully, we're still at a stage where that produces a lot of false alarms. And we have a lot of false alarms in our life. And so setting the bar so that it's super sensitive will probably not help these patients because we're going to get tired of going back and forth every time somebody has a slightly high heart rate or a slightly high fever or something that triggers an alarm that doesn't pan out to be a significant event. So getting better and better at that, but I don't think those systems are there quite yet. We do know that across the country, as we measure this in more than 40 hospitals, that the quality of CPR during an event could use improvement. Even inside the hospital and in the emergency departments, the chest compression fraction tends to be less than 70% in the first five minutes of cardiac arrest, because oftentimes we're interrupting it to do exams, to intubate, to give meds, to get vascular access, et cetera. And so there's probably opportunity for improvement there. We're generally pushing too fast, not too slow, and we're generally pushing too shallow, not too deep. What we've, what we've studied and been able to find out is that high quality CPR is actually not common and that we um, can associate now better quality CPR judged by being within the guidelines compared to outside of the guidelines with better outcomes short and long term, including neurologic recovery. We do know that certain forms in certain centers that are resourced to do it with point of care training can improve the CPR quality, the process of care, and that using debriefing as an adjunct, that just doing the training doesn't move the needle. But doing the, debrief, but doing the training plus the debriefing, the reflection and the changes that occur in quality improvement, those two together actually move the needle. And in our hospital, we did it sequentially, where we started with the training, but we weren't doing the debriefings yet. And although we improved a little bit and we improved in simulation on the quality of CPR, the patient care didn't change. But once we added the debriefing, the hot debriefing and the cold debriefing afterwards of the real patient events, then we started to see the process of care, quality of CPR improve, and the survival outcomes improve. So it was that combination that we think made the difference, not just one or just the other. And then we also have been studying in the lab and are starting to study in humans goal-directed CPR based on physiology, not on anatomy. So how many know what the current recommendations are for depth of chest compression in adults? Two inches to 2.4 inches. Come on, how are you going to measure that, right? For real? That's the recommendation. That's based on good science from studies that was derived from the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium two inches to 2.4 inches. But you guys aren't even measuring that, at least on the defibrillators that I saw in the hospital and in the emergency department here, maybe some of you are, but most of you are not measuring during and, and, and displaying during CPR the depth of measurement. So I suspect that you're probably not getting as deep as you think you are, because we weren't when we weren't measuring it. We sometimes don't even when we do measure it. And so if we're not measuring it, we're not able to do it. But what we found in the pig lab is that not everybody needs 2 to 2.4 inches or the same depth. People are different. Huh, that's, 
a discovery, isn't it? So the little old lady or the young child were not all the same. And so what we're finding is that more importantly than the actual depth, the diastolic blood pressure, and, and Kevin, this won't surprise you as a cardiac surgeon, right? The diastolic blood pressure, the perfusion pressure of the heart, the driving pressure to get blood to the, to the uh, heart during diastole or relaxation is what determines essentially the myocardial blood flow that's going to be associated with return of spontaneous circulation. So we've identified some targets of greater than 30 millimeters of pressure in the, uh, in the older, over one-year-old patient and over 25 millimeters of pressure diastolic in the under one un, under one year old patient that are all associated with better cardiac resuscitation but also survival and survival with good neurologic outcome those studies are still relatively early on in children and adults they're well established in pigs now and so the heart association has not moved to recommend a given cutoff that you should be shooting to which is appropriate because it's only a few studies and they're still associational and we don't know if targeting that. But in the pig lab, what I can tell you, and this is, this is personal, this is not from the heart association, is that using vasopressors rather than every two or four minutes, right, as recommended late in the resuscitation when the patient is already in this condition, if you use it early in the resuscitation and keep that diastolic blood pressure up, the survival outcomes are tremendous and the neurologic outcomes are tremendous. So perhaps in the future we'll be using epinephrine or another vasopressor, but we'll be using it in a different way than we use it now. Now we tend to use it late. Does anybody know the time interval from collapse to delivery of epinephrine in the latest paramedic trial published in the New England Journal, which was an out-of-hospital witnessed cardiac arrest adult population, more than 8,000 of them in the UK, and it took a mean of almost 20 minutes before the first dose of epinephrine was given because there was downtime while the, there was travel. They had things to do. They had to evaluate them to be shocked. Sometimes they were shocked if they were in a shockable rhythm before a drug was given. So the trials that are out there that are looking at epinephrine versus placebo are generally late epinephrine versus placebo, and they have been negative. Interestingly enough, epinephrine in placebo-controlled trials in adult out-of-hospital cardiac arrest did not seem to improve survival outcome. It did improve ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. It did statistically improve survival to hospital admission, but it did not improve hospital length of stay, survival, or neurologic outcome. It was not worse but it was not better, and there was a larger proportion of neurologically injured survivors that survived in the epinephrine group. And so we're questioning now how epinephrine should be used, if it should be used in the manner that it's being used now. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we should definitely throw out epinephrine. It just means we have to relook at, in the era of good quality CPR, do we need it, and is there another goal that we should be using? So I've emphasized goal-directed therapy for targeting the brain and heart. We've mentioned oxygen as a controversial. We know that therapeutic hypothermia, there are additional studies to try to say what level of control, active control of temperature is appropriate. Currently, 36.8 seems very reasonable, 36, 35. Fewer and fewer patients are being cooled to 32 to 34 degrees, except under special circumstances, particularly if there are persistent um, seizures. And can we use, this is an old ECMO circuit that's huge compared to what we have now. You can barely see the patient in the middle of the screen there. But the ability to support, at least transiently, blood flow to the heart and brain is now getting more and more common and possible but just because it's possible doesn't mean we should do it. We know that our technology is improving, is increasing. You can see all of the different devices. You don't see any people in this picture. And so it's not just going to be technology that solves our problems. We are going to have to train people to use this technology in the appropriate manner. So how do we really move to improve the quality of life of our patients? 
We know that getting with the guidelines, the uh, black lines in this case are when resuscitation guidelines were followed. The gray lines for every category worse when they're not. So we know that getting with the guidelines makes a difference. But when we think about the in and ho out of hospital environments, they're very different chains of survival. So we have to think about the individual, the team, and the environment. And we have to wonder, did you ever think the Heart and Stroke Foundation or American Heart Association would say, don't use an ABC algorithm? Do CAB, compressions first? Did you ever think they would say, don't give 100% oxygen to somebody in cardiac arrest? They're considering it. The neonates already get room air instead of 100% oxygen when they arrest. Did you ever think they would say, don't give epinephrine? Because they might say that based on studies that suggest the way we're using it now is no better than giving salt water. How about intubate early? Studies in hospital suggest that early intubation is associated with worse outcome rather than better outcome. And how about if they said don't stop CPR after 20 minutes of failed resuscitation because for certain selected patients, ECMO, extracorporeal support, et cetera, has been demonstrated to potentially have reasonably good survival outcomes based on the etiology, special population. So think about CAB. Think about for uh, the targets that the Heart Association is asking you to do. Think about measuring what we're doing and whether all the emphasis on drugs is really where we should be focusing when a patient arrests. Think about adjuncts. None. None of the mechanical CPR device trials to date have shown improved outcome over good quality manual chest compressions. There are special circumstances, long transports, going to the cath lab, et cetera, which suggests that it may be safer for the providers and it may be easier and better quality CPR during transport, during the, the uh, CPR in the cath lab. But when good quality, when it's compared to good quality, Manual CPR, the question's still out. So do we need better devices? Do we need better quality standard CPR? It's really just the tip of the iceberg. And what I'd just like to end with is, if we think outside the box, if we think as other industries might, so this is General Motors, this is their, uh, this is their center, their command center, where for their cars, they have a monitoring system embedded so that all of the monitoring that's going in in your car gets transmitted to a central site. So that if there's a sudden stop or the airbag deploys or the bumper is hit, they can call into your, they can call into your car and they can identify by RFID chip where you are to geolocate you. They can call you and ask you if you're okay, are you moving? They can detect motion in the car to know if you're all right and whether they should activate 911 to find you. And just like they're monitoring the motor oil and the wheel balance and the tension in your tires, they essentially can continuously monitor. It sounds like, like our EMR is doing for our patients with artificial intelligence in the background to get early identification of a catastrophe. I think this kind of surveillance is likely going to invade our lives and also provide that early warning. Sports science, Fitbits, iWatches, et cetera, the capability to do early detection is here. Why isn't instant replay in our hospitals? Why are we so worried? If the sports athletes who have millions of dollars on the line can allow us to watch whether that ball at the US Open is in or out by that much, and they can replay it 100 times for all of us in the world to see, why is it that for patients' lives, we're not doing instant replay in our own hospital environments? We would have the data then to know how the teamwork was, what we were doing, and what the interventions were done well and what weren't. How many people do we have to train? Can we learn from the immunologists who develop vaccines and study herd immunity? How much training, who has to be trained and how much do they have to be trained to make the system immune and work smoothly for cardiac arrest. We don't know that. How are we going to train? I just came back from Italy, and we challenged all of the pediatric residency programs in Italy. There are 34 of them 
to train up their teams to the PAL scenarios in their locale for five months and then come together to Rome to have an Olympic battle over three days where they each competed on the PAL scenarios with increasing, increasing uh, sort of perturbations to try to make them harder and harder and came out with a winner. That was a training episode. It wasn't evaluative in terms of a goal. And they knew they were doing it. And they ran the toughest scenarios blindfolded. The leader was blindfolded. So they had to use their team members. And they performed amazingly brilliantly in that environment. So how can we get peak performance? I think how we do that is going to change. Here in our emergency department, which is live capture videotaped, these two providers, the charge nurse and the physician uh, in charge, are wearing near-infrared headbands that are monitoring through near-infrared spectroscopy, functional nears, the brain blood flow in their brains as we increase or decrease the task load during a simulated cardiac arrest. And so we could find their threshold, both by the, T the NASA TLX um, you know, checklist, but we can also map the brain blood flow and what areas of their brain are responding to various challenges to detect their threshold, a peak performance laboratory. We don't wear the near infrared headbands, but we do have the same data capture of their NASA TLX task load performance during real resuscitations because that resuscitation is live captured on video and reviewed by the quality improvement team. This is not only a first world kind of phenomenon. We can take these principles and have demonstrated that it can be done in developing countries like Tanzania, in Botswana, and in India. And probably in the future, our training is not going to be carefully gated, but more of our information is going to be exchanged by various forms of social media in protected and unprotected manner. In the future, I envision a world where we can collect data on virtually all hospital deaths, maybe out of hospital, and that there will be coalitions of groups that will do more intensive discovery and management down to research data sets. So in the future, I think we'll get better and better at identifying the patients, defining and implementing those, those interventions that work, and then measuring the outcomes that will feed back to change the interventions that we train. That, in my vision, is the past, present, and future of resuscitation. I'd like to open it up, if there's time, for a few questions or comments. Please use your mics. So Farhan, I'm going to call on you first. So at, uh, at least at Children's. Wait, wait a second. Okay? So at least. This way. No, no, no. No, no, no. So at least at, um, at the Children's Hospital here, there's not, is there a, a rapid response team or no rapid response team? So, so some of the structural things that you brought up that really challenge us, we need, to, we need to think about rapid response versus early warning scores and how do we do that. We've got to do better, uh, better training for the moments that happen, so maybe some of that rapid, low frequency, uh, high frequency. Low dose, dose training, low dose, yeah. Or high dose. Um, we've got to think a, a little bit about our, our CQI um, and, and taking data and, and, and registering that and looking that. And I think that those are sort of the challenges that I, I'm seeing for us as a group. I don't know the adult side as well, but I think that it probably resonates with, with both sides. And I think that's where we kind of have to think about. And, and so my question to you was, you know, where, where do you see, because this was not, this is not one day's worth of work. This is 15 years worth of work. That's right. This is multiple different stages. Where do you see, you can't change everything in, in the world at once. So if you're picking and you're saying to people, these, these are all gaps there, where are you starting? And building your momentum to start to build towards all of that, because change management can't happen all at so once. So I guess um, I agree with you. It doesn't happen overnight. I would start where you have a champion, some passion, and some data that something is, one, working well, and some where it's not. Because if we focus only on the negative, it becomes a punitive kind of remediation thing, which I think we want to stay away from. So um, I would try to look at both 
an area or a system that seems to work really well, measure the outcomes and measure the same thing where somebody has a passion where they believe something isn't going so well and they want to change it and they want support and resources to change it. And then not to pick it all at once, but to learn from what others have done that have worked, to select a few things to try and measure and demonstrate in a very small constricted pilot that it actually seems to make a difference. And I'd say the biggest mistake that I think we made along the way was that we pulled it off as if it was a research project initially, whereas what it would have been much better as a quality improvement project for something that the people in the trenches wanted to change or felt needed to change. It could be as simple as end tidal CO2 monitoring of patients early during bag mask. It could be um, get that chest compression fraction up to 90% in the first five minutes. It could be something very simple and obvious, something that you don't need a lot of equipment to measure that you could just quickly survey afterwards and say, did we achieve that or not? How about somebody from the ED? I don't know if, if you have any comments about, are there things that you're trying to change or uh, or that have come up from either the people who are working for you or with you, like epinephrine or something like that that's hot? Um, first of all, excellent talk as uh, usual, thank you. I was going to actually return a question, then I can answer yours. Okay. Um, so I agree with you that we have to um, measure more how we do the basic and do the basic better, and I think in hospital, you know, for someone that had a practice as well out of hospital, I think out of hospital are doing this better than what we're doing in terms of monitoring quality of CPR. They're better at it, changing every two minutes and all that. So we have to improve and we have to uh, change the way we're doing this. Um, what is your view? You had a few slides where you commented on ECMO. We started here a 24-7 uh, multi-site program for adult on eCPR and actually VV ECMO as well, but we have a, a non-call you know, team remotely. What is your view mm -hmm. on it in terms of the future? Programs are exploding a bit everywhere um, in different centers, and I'm curious to see what's your opinion on So this. I think um, you know, ECMO had a lot of success early on with eCPR, partly because the patients were so highly selected um, to have a reversible cause. Um, as ECMO has kind of expanded, uh, a lot of places are really going beyond, and it's gotten beyond the capability of a small group of very dedicated people to deliver it, just not practical. And so it's, it's almost like what I said, that at, you know, in that select group that you start with, in that center that can really do it well and does it all the time, it gets done really well, and those patients do really well, and there's like this spectacular publication about how well it works. But then as it rolls down the road, we get down to that 20% effect of what that original group found. And I feel like we're with ECMO. I love it. At my hospital, we have a lot of commitment, and we're starting to do it more and more for selected patients and have a, that capability. We haven't gone out to do it. Um, but I think in that environment, it will do quite well, as long as we stay true to the selective nature. But um, I'm, I'm afraid that as it, as it sort of rolls out and becomes the thing you need to do, that we may lose the efficacy of that because it's just applied in a different way with a different quality. Same thing with cooling. Um, you know, in Chettle Sunday in, in Norway, when he cools, he's not just cooling, he's like at the bedside titrating the, the vasopressors as well as cooling those patients. And so the impact of what he's able to show with his post-resuscitative care sometimes is not transmitted to the other hospitals because they're not doing that other special meticulous care that goes along with his cooling protocol as opposed to what I do or you do, et cetera. Um, so I think we're going to have to be careful with saying we should or we shouldn't, but I think the principles of high quality eCPR for selected patients is going to persist. I think those there are patients that, in my opinion, would definitely benefit and be appropriate to do it for but it's very hard to do it across the board. One size doesn't fit all. Is that your experience as well or, or no? Yeah, I think as the program uh, you know, gets some maturity, we're, we're learning maybe we're probably overdoing it at this point uh, in the initial yeah. phase, yeah. which is I think normal when everyone is very motivated yeah. and excited yeah. at the beginning of a program. But we have to monitor our, our data and yeah. probably titrate it to the patients that really benefit, obviously, 
It's, you know, costly therapy, not only in terms of direct costs, but yeah. indirect costs, getting personnel um, in after hours. Sometimes that can lead to canceling I, cases. I, truthfully, in the next I think day. those problems in the next five years are going to go away. I think the technology yeah. with ultrasound, with multi-pronged. So like we're, people are developing needles like a hair comb. You just stab it in the groin and wherever the blood's, you know, it's a bunch of needles that are close by, whichever one thread, thread a, a wire through it. You've got either vein or artery. I mean, the cannulation part of this is going to get simpler and simpler. That's not going to be the impediment to ECMO of the future. The artful and thoughtful application of the flow, how much, where, how to do it, is probably going to be the key piece of it, right? And so um, I think those are practical issues now, definitely, about the cannulation being sort of the rate limiting step. But I don't think that's the, the application limitation for it. I think that's going to go. I agree. Away. I don't know, Kevin. Kevin, do you have an opinion on is the cannulation going to get easy enough that I could do it? Uh, I, I don't think the cannulation is an issue. I think that it, what the issue is is what you said, patient management. Yeah. Uh, we can cannulate the patients. We can put them on and, and we can support them, and we often have great ECMO runs, but we, we still don't have a, a good survivor. And I would say that our current um, our current prognostic criteria based on etiology, et cetera, are probably pretty lousy. So our predictability of who will respond and who won't is still at a primitive stage. But as we get better, uh, maybe imaging and deep brain oxygen, you know, um, monitoring, uh, non-invasive probably, and maybe microdialysis and those kinds of things, we may get a better window on the best candidates based on EEG, based on microdialysis, based on other factors, uh, biomarkers, et cetera. But we're not, I don't think we're quite there yet. But maybe in five years, you know, we'll, the other we'll be there. Thing that does better, I think, anecdotally is patients who have been passed off. So yeah. Right? Yeah. Like yeah. And then, and then they get the coronary stage. Yeah. And they have a, they have a reversible lesion, right? They have something, they have some, Thing that you can fix. <laughs> That's what we need. Something we can fix. Vinay, I just, I, I'm going to ask this question to you, but I wonder if the, the subtext of all of your presentations, looping the four together um, that you've given while you've been here very generously to us at McGill, is has been you know resuscitation, past, present, and future. Back to the basics, like really thinking about the fundamentals. And I think, as intensivists, we we get this all the time. Not as much when I work in the emerge, but it's sometimes there's a new technology and and it's a sexy new thing, and we focus on that. So in a system where we're thinking about eCPR and instituting that and doing all that, we don't have a, a system where we record cardiac arrest outcomes. We don't know what the neurologic uh, uh, intact survival is of our cardiac arrest at our system here. We don't measure CPR feedback in, in a physiologic or in a uh, physiologic way in terms of uh, antenna CO2, diastolic blood pressure, or just simple metrics of CBR and have a, a CPR feedback device. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah, and, yeah. and, and, that, and that's, really, that's really my question to you is that, that I think that I wonder, and, and this I'm is- I'm gonna hold party. that concept. I hear yeah. it back to the basics. I think you're talking about the basics of what uh, we know works now, well, but not the basics of how we're training or how we're absolutely. implementing. So, so, so functioning on what, what are the, what are the tying in patient safety to what you're doing in simulation. Yeah. Thinking about, um, you didn't talk about it here, the Botswana project that you were involved with with Pete Meany, where by doing low fidelity or low, low technology mannequins, you've actually reduced mortality there by 70 to 80% um, uh, for, all, for all hospital comers, not just for those with cardiac arrest. Exactly. And it was just implementing a program and measuring quality that improved the outcomes the most. We're chasing that, that small percentage point where the eCPR might work, which is great, which is what we should be doing. But at the same time, if we're doing that, we've got to, got, you've got to learn that. to walk before you can run. Or if yeah. you're going to run, you've got to get all the building bricks to yeah. walking as well. I would just uh, piggyback on what uh, Farhan just said. And it's not only, so back to basics, simple things can improve outcomes. But the second point you brought up is that we're not measuring outcomes. And I'll go a step further. We don't have informatics systems. Like I'm blown away with, we're not measure, we're not making, we don't have data. Like you're talking about data on outcome that we're not systematically collecting data and we certainly don't have real-time data. We don't have anything that is an integrated platform and we certainly aren't predicting outcomes. Like that's, that's like Star Wars to me. I can't even believe you're doing that. That's, 
crazy to me because I, I have to, I, I fill in a ledger with my hand to record um, data for patients. Like I'm literally doing it by hand in Excel sheet. It's crazy to me how leaps and bounds you are ahead in data collection, which translates to outcome collection and then identifying what it is we can do better and using that as our, as our launch pad for quality initiatives. Quality initiatives that are based first on back to basics. So you can't, you can't improve what you can't see. Just to reassure you, one, our whole hospital doesn't work that well. <laughs> but we were just there, and we started, as you said, sort of one piece at a time. So it's I bet there are areas in your hospital where it's very easy, if you worked with your informatics and your IT folks, to be able to accomplish some of this in your ER trauma bay or in your cardiac ICU or something, where, where you could download from your bedside monitors and your, um, and your uh, ventilators, let's say, this data. Just, you can just follow your ECG tracing and your pulse ox to see what your rate and your, and your interruptions are in CPR. I mean, it's, it's not that hard. But you do have to have the champions in the area that allow you to go and pull that. And you can pretty much on your review screen, which most hospitals have, you can pull that up and you can just review that with a team that was there and say, hey, how did we do in our first five minutes on chest compression fraction, you know, pick something easy. But once they understand that, gosh, we thought we were really doing well in that, and we aren't, or we are doing well in that, how come we're doing so well? Well, gosh, we decided that as a team, we're not gonna intubate in the first five minutes. If we have good bag vas ventilation, we're gonna stick with it, right? We're not gonna interrupt to intubate. And you guys might be good enough that you don't interrupt to intubate anyway, but pick something, but examine what they're doing really well. Because if you just pound them with like, improve this, improve that. Like we get pounded with that every day. Who wants that, right? Um, but show that there are areas that are doing better and why they're doing better and then others will come along and say, hey, we're doing pretty well too. Let's measure what we're doing, but I want to fix that other thing over there. We can help you, like there's a coalition now of 40 children's hospitals. Um, there isn't, to my knowledge, a same coalition of adult children's hospital, uh, adult hospitals that are uh, in this coalition, but we're, we can help you depending on who your manufacturers of your bedside monitors, et cetera, to get a system that you can have a pretty easy, just sort of um, uh, job aid to be able to download that stuff pretty quickly. And then uh, for the pediatric folks, we want you to join the PD Rescue Network, which is actually sharing that and dashboarding it so that we can all see each other's stuff so that we can improve it. But um, through Farhan, we can we can talk about if you want to you know if you want to join a coalition or form a coalition or do it in Canada rather than the U.S. You know. Just on behalf of everyone, I wanted to thank you for taking the time with us, Abigail. This has been a real pleasure for us, and um, we don't get people of your quality coming all the time. Uh, we get a lot of great speakers, um, but someone who's taking the science and and really getting us to say how do you use it? Think about your education, think about your systems, get that real high high end science into your practice. So. so Thank you very much. And what I'll do is invite those that would like to ask any questions to kind of stay afterwards because after one o'clock and there's still others. Thank you. Thanks a lot.